Good morning. Good morning. Happy Halloween. My name is Joan Cooper. I'm a member of the breakfast crew on Wednesday, and I'm also a member of the bell choir. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to celebrate Totenfest. It's in memory of the saints of this church, our family and friends who have died in the last year. Please contact the church this week if you have any additions to the names to be recognized in worship. Next Sunday, faith formation also begins in the parlor at 9.15. Today, there will be an intergenerational All Hallows Eve gathering in the fellowship hall immediately after worship. Everybody is welcome. Lunch bunch is coming up. Mark your calendar for November 9th at 12 at noon. Sauerkraut supper tickets are now available, and the dinner is to go only this year. Next week, on Thursday, 11, November 4th, I have a hard time realizing next week's November. Join us to support our Tijuana missions. See John Muskoff to buy tickets and Susan this a.m. They are out in the narthex. Lynn Werewell has an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here on behalf of the Worcester Homeless Task Force. We are gearing up with the Salvation Army, 180, and United Way to provide a shelter from the harsh temperatures and weather. So when it's 20 degrees or below, we will be opening the shelter at Salvation Army in the gymnasium portion. The shelter will be open then at 6 o'clock in the evening. A hot meal will pre be served and safe shelter and sleeping space as well as restrooms will be provided. There are many levels of support that you could choose to make the endeavor a reality and I'm counting on you for this. We are seeking volunteers to help. One way you could help is to prepare meals, and we're asking that people prepare for about 15 guests. You could simply prepare the meal, and a partner could deliver it to the Salvation Army. You could prepare the meal and deliver and serve it at the Salvation Army on the designated nights, which for Trinity will be Saturdays. The meal would be expected to be served around 6 o'clock when the shelter opens. If you're interested in those opportunities, I have a sign up here and I could see you after church in the narthex to sign up for the meal preparation. Another way you could help is by donating to United Way using the designation, designation Severe Weather Shelter. Additionally, we are seeking volunteers who are interested in opening the shelter and staffing it during the hours of 6 to 10 p.m. You are invited to attend an informational session tomorrow night, Monday, November 1st at 6 p.m. at the Salvation Army to learn more about how the severe weather shelter works. I can be the contact person if you have questions. And if you have questions about the meal preparation, Janet Burkhart is our contact person. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Let us be in a spirit of worship. For all who are able, please rise and join in the call to worship. Hear, O people of God, our God is one. Hear the commandments of our God. First, love your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Hear, O people of God, our God is one. Recite the commandments to your children and hold them in your hearts. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these calls to love. Amen. 
Let us join in the opening prayer. O Holy One, source of all life and ground of all love, we thank you for your love that never lets us go. Thank you for the privilege of gathering in this space with your people, our neighbors, to worship you. We come that our hearts might be open to you and to one another. As we worship you today, help us to respond to the call of love, to love you, our neighbors, and ourselves. Amen. first and it's just the coolest thing do i get to do the mission or are you going to do something uh no, no okay. we're waiting <laughs> yeah go ahead okay <laughs> i'm confused okay no. so, so um one of the things that i need you to know is that every time you are in this building and whether you are here for worship whether you are here for um, serving breakfast, whether you're here for the wellness program or any other programs that we offer, you are in this place with the Spirit of Jesus. And how awesome is that to be able to be able to do that? So you need to always remember that opportunity. We are not just always supposed to be here on Sundays. We, we can worship God every day, 24 hours a day. And that's an important thing to remember. So one of my jobs as Directors of Christian Education and Arts is to offer opportunities for you to serve 
and to come and learn and be a part of a small group. And if you got a bulletin, beside the bulletin there was a paper that showed faith formation opportunities. And if you didn't get one on the way in, you can get one on the way out. But it tells you all of the chances you have to join in a small group. And it's a wonderful thing to get to do. It used to be that I know Sunday school classes and a lot of classes and groups were huge. You know, you would come and there would be 20, 25, 30 people there. And you know, that's okay, but that's not the way the times are anymore. And my true belief is that wherever two or three are gathered in God's name, God is there with us. And it's important to be able to be there to learn and to become friends with each other and to remind ourselves we are children of God. So it's an important thing. So as you look through here, there's lots of different things that you can do. Some of them are via Zoom, because we've gotten into that habit because of COVID. And then others are coming here and getting a chance to be in person and to do things together. So I just want to remind you that it's important to always get to study, to take time each day to pray to God, to read some devotionals, to come and gather any day of the week here with other people, and to build your faith and make it stronger for yourself and for other people. So that's my mission moment for today. Thank you. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this his holy word. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, God. You came long before we were ever here, and you will be in this place long after we are gone. You are more than enough, so we ask that you pour out your spirit on all of us, and especially now to fulfill what you have required of us, to be full of love for our neighbor, in our heart, soul, mind, and strength to love you. Amen. I hear a theme that will tie us into this season of the year today, and that's our ancestors. We've just talked about Martin Luther. Next week, we're going to remember um, the saints of the church. And every fall, I don't know about you, but it's like a nostalgia feeling where your mind begins to recall those places and times before us that touched our lives and our hearts, our minds and our souls. Jesus was accessing the teachings of his ancestors. He did it all the time. But in this scripture, it's especially important to Jesus to teach what his ancestors gave him, the commandments of Judaism and his Jewish faith. In fact, we can always remember that Jesus is Jewish, was Jewish, was born Jewish, and died Jewish. He's a Jewish person. 
and we can remember that we continue to preach and teach the Hebrew Bible for good reasons. The law informed Jesus' lifetime. We remember that we continue to teach the ways of God through teachings of wisdom. Perhaps we could reframe one of the things that Martin Luther and the Protestant ref reformers gave me and you, that by grace we are saved and not by works. We don't have to fulfill the commandments perfectly to be a right relationship with God, and that's important and powerful and beautiful. At the same time, Jesus certainly is telling us here, he is Jewish because he knew the commandments of Deuteronomy and Leviticus the law codes, and he repeated them. Their ethical basis for his lifetime was worth repeating, and he kept them. He kept teaching those commandments, just as we teach our ancestors' commandments over and over here. That's why we keep coming back some days. Our ancestors gave us something that we need, and we come back here to get it and to pass it on. That's wonderful. I'm going to teach on a portion of this law that is new to me to speak up about. Um, I did uh, express earlier that I was going to preach on mental health again. I keep preaching on it. I believe in um, the ability of this pulpit to be a world changer, like we told the kids, that our voices in this place are world-changing voices, heart-changing voices. And so um, my invitation to us is to open in our hearts what we need to open to become open to love. That's the purpose of today's scripture. And I value the way that faith both informs our love for each other, for God, and it gives us a community to be in trusting relationship with each other and God as well. Even when those times in life that challenge us are very near, as they are for all of us at different times in different ways. I think that destigmatizing mental health, which is the reason why I preach on mental health, to destigmatize it um, so that it's not suffered in silence, that's the dream that I have. I think it makes me a better neighbor to others because my life, of course, as you have seen in me, um, has gone through mental health challenges. And, and I think that I appreciate your stories are brave. And when we talk about stories in church, in the times and ways that you choose to and that I choose to, we are opening ourselves up to love in powerful ways. The commandment that Jesus taught on this day, first of all, he's not um, in a fight with this prophet. He has such a prophetic voice that often when we imagine Jesus on his walk of faith, he's a challenging voice. But in this commandment, he's, instead of challenging the scribe, he agrees with the scribe. They agree with one another. And I think that's profound. And for me, as we open this text um, with an eye to mental health, the commandment is very easy. And that's so beneficial. The best part of this teaching for me is he always remembers that we are to be a people of love. And that's more than enough for the deepest and toughest questions of any person's life, to love. He does say some things in this that will help me process what mental health means to me. But the truth is, all our hearts, when they open, sometimes have been broken. The, the power of God's word for love opens the places in us that have been touched by very deep hurts. And in me, I respect and honor the hurts that are in this room today that I cannot know, but that some of you are brave enough to talk about and some of you choose to pray about. All of that is valid. It's beautiful to me that you have trusted God with your life story enough to be in the pew today. I light a candle now as I begin um, diving a little deeper. Jesus was Jewish and they would light a candle every week uh, in my friend's home that is Jewish. They light the candle on Fridays for Shabbat and it's a teaching time of God's presence being close. So to be honest, talking about mental health can be scary. If we light the candle, my prayer for you is you see the candle, you recall who you are in God. That's all I need us to know, really. God will be close, always in all of our life story. So remembering our ancestors, um, I pray with this text 
the same teaching that Jesus said over and over also, which is a Deuteronomic scripture. His ancestors repeated it daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jewish people today continue to say that prayer, um, sometimes at morning and at night, daily. You can say it and you can breathe deeply, recalling God's presence is close. It reminds me of the Lord's Prayer in many ways. In other ways, we keep mantras close to us. So we light the candle now, and if you need the mantra at any time, I hope that you will pray it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And may the candle be an invitation to um, be focused on what God has to say. If the words that I speak uh, bring up hurts in this space, please look at the candle and breathe deeply of God's presence. And you're not alone, and we're among friends. The scripture says, love God with your mind, which the text in Deuteronomy does not say. Um, the Hebrew scripture does not include the word, love God with your mind. It doesn't say love God with your understanding or with your mind. And the Greek uh, meaning of the word for mind in this scripture means dianoia, deep thought, and understanding, which means mental putting together, intelligence, and intellect. The mind has been on uh, this community of faith's wavelength for many years as we've served others who deal with mental illness. But I deal with mental illness. And to be honest, um, destigmatizing it means recognizing that even when I serve people um, in my ministry, I have to remember that I am um, a wounded healer. And many of us are wounded healers in this place. That our depth of life story and struggle informs our ability to be compassionate, to be brave, to be proud of who we are, including our brokenheartedness and that it's okay to have those wounded places. I am not a mental health professional, I am a pastor, and I believe that in our staff team here, we are willing to witness to what God does through the broken places in life by healing us and strengthening us and giving us compassionate guidance. But I put cards out today for mental health professionals. They're in the back narthex. They're always there. Today's just another invitation always we need to be reminded that we don't have to travel alone. When Jesus says, love your neighbor, I think he's saying, you need a neighbor. <laughs> um, an isolation in mental health is very painful. And so we are to love each other so that we aren't isolated and we don't struggle through any challenge in life alone and isolated. He also, I believe, is sharing this wisdom, loving God and loving neighbor, because community means you don't have to be silent. Reverend Dr. Rachel Keith is a member of the UCC Mental Health Network. And I ask for um, your prayers about an issue that has been on my mind um, as a prayerful one, because people in our society are dealing with suicidal ideation at a level that is unconscionable and distressing. Rachel Keith has been one in the UCC to write about it. It is the number 10 um, cause of death in our society right now. It is the 10th highest cause of death in our society today. She says this in her book, The Life-Saving Church. And I take a breath and look at the candle, recalling God's presence. I don't write this book because I think I have the answers. I write it to engage conversation because suicide seems like the last taboo of the church. We get anxious when someone talks about it. Requests for prayers for a loved one who is hospitalized for suicidal behavior are almost whispered, if they're spoken out loud at all. People shy away from survivors of suicide loss because they're uncomfortable and don't know what to say. Those who might want prayers, let alone tangible care, for their own struggles with suicidality often don't dare to ask. 
There's so much silence around suicide in the church that it is shame and stigma and keeping us from healing and wholeness, even while we could be a people of abundant life. I don't like silence around mental illness, and that's why I bring the quote today, to open us to love. And I have a story to tell. I was reading some of these stories from a project that's very near to many people who are either survivors of a loss due to suicide or who have survived their own suicidal desperation. That project is called the Semicolon Project. Has anyone heard of the Semicolon Project? It's one of the things that I learned about in Cleveland. And my friends got tattoos. It's a semicolon. And it's a beautiful symbol because it's a reminder that your story isn't over. One person I know who has this tattoo lost their father to suicide. And another person survived um, a hospitalization. The reason why they got the tattoo is theirs to tell. But I will say this, in the news story from 2021 in Idaho, this is one example of the semicolon project, a tattoo parlor gave these tattoos away for free. The semicolon, if you're a grammar nerd, represents the period, which is the end, but it doesn't end. The comma is below the period. And I just love that. To me, it represents resurrection and hope. And also destigmatizing because people sometimes will share their story if someone notices their tattoo. And it's very brave. It's not for all of us, and it's not necessary for all of us to be that way. But it does mean to me resurrection, and that's why I share it. They get the tattoo, um, people, will, people can see the tattoo, and it means I'm not alone. And it destigmatizes the fact that many people do struggle with suicidal desperation. It's profound. And I share it again because before we know it, um, life can be full of challenges. Many of us have already gone through those challenges and still will go through them. To notice that God can show up for us in them means we don't have to go without faith resources into those spaces. Sometimes faith can feel like a resource, a lifeboat. And that's my prayer for any person of faith. I think that Jesus intends to go with us wherever life takes us, into any place, any time, any struggle, and any challenge. does not matter what life's outcomes are, Jesus is going to show up. And that Jesus would show up and did show up for the people um, and our ancestors' faiths, too. I think it's incredible. My next step for this particular day uh, with this particular text, though, is to challenge Jesus a little bit more. I'm going to challenge him. Because I don't need to explain how hard it can be to live uh, with a mind that sometimes struggles. The mind is not always the easiest to love God with, is it not? Your mind can tell you a lot of things that are not loving towards God and not loving towards yourself. What is it that Jesus would allow us to do to have grace in those situations? If you have ever felt um, a sense of mental illness, you might have felt like God said to you, I hope God loves me for exactly who I am, that I am valid and valuable, and that I am beloved. That's my prayer. But the mind can be harder to love God with for people with mental illness than with the heart and then with our soul. And I don't think that I would agree with Jesus that we can understand God perfectly. In fact, the only way Jesus could have understood God perfectly is because he was God. None of us are meant to have all of the answers in life. We only can go into the spaces that we're called into with love. And God isn't asking us to understand perfectly. When the text says, love God with your understanding, it is incredible that we as humans have minds that can understand. But we also are limited. Can we allow Martin Luther's voice to come across the ages and say, grace is sufficient because we don't understand everything. And we never will understand everything. But grace is sufficient. I think that's a powerful reason to remember Martin Luther. Grace is sufficient. For the times when hearts break, grace will be sufficient. For the times when our minds tell us you're not worthy of love, grace will come in if we ask. And even when we don't ask, grace comes unbidden.
my prayer now is that um, I would invite us to do two things. One is to share in a prayer, which I put in your bulletin. Hmm. Oh. And I hope that when you pray this, uh, we remember that we're a part of a network of faith communities that deeply love all people, including those who have suffered from mental illness. Hear these words. They're from the Reverend Dr. Sarah Lund, who is our National Office Minister for Mental Health. God of love, we celebrate that today you are still speaking a word of acceptance, wholeness, and inclusion of all your differently abled people. We give thanks for this church and the ways we seek to live out Jesus' commandment to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. On this day, when we think of mental health, we pray for people who live with untreated mental illness and who cannot find help and cannot afford medical care. We pray for an end to the stigma of mental illness. We pray for families torn apart by mental health diseases and for families that hold on to one another during difficult times of illness. We pray for those who have lost a loved one to suicide. We pray for mental health caregivers, for scientific researchers, and for professionals who seek to bring compassion, treatment, and healing to those who suffer from brain diseases. We pray for children, teens, and young adults learning to live with newly diagnosed brain diseases. And we pray for people burdened by labels and stereotypes. We pray for people who are victims of bullying and discrimination because of their disability. We give thanks for the many gifts that people with mental health disease bring into the world. And we celebrate the creative genius of artists, scientists, authors, scholars, business leaders, actors, musicians, inventors, and presidents who live with mental illness. Now still speaking God, as the mysteries of the human brain unfold, we remain in awe of the intricate ways in which we are created in your image. And I would add, God is still speaking. God is still speaking. May we be reflections of your love in this world. May we remember that the story is never over in Jesus Christ. Amen.
want to begin today with a little uh, opening um, that uh, I found that I like in our book of worship. Let us pray that the Almighty and merciful God may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and rid the world of homelessness, falsehood, hunger, and disease. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who've lost heart. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. Holy God, you, your love embraces the whole world, and that's the only sure thing that we know. You never seem to grow tired of hearing our complaints or mending our wounds. Thank you for sharing the strength and energy of your spirit with us and within us in our times of need. You know us full well when you watch over us with the care of a compassionate shepherd. Pray today for our families, those who are gathered together and those who are broken in some way. May we learn to offer your peace to those who are closest to us when they suffer. And we know the deep grief of loneliness and the pain that comes with fractured relationships. You comfort us in every instance of our loss. For human goodwill inside our sanctuaries and around our kitchen tables, we pray. Help us to truly be ourselves, the children of God you created us to be. Help us to put aside all posturing and falsehood. Help us to dig deep in our spiritual life. And in all of our sincere striving to follow in the way of Jesus, we all wander off at times. We pray for all the families gathered here. Some are grandparents, mothers, fathers, partners, children. We thank you for our unique heritage and all that those connections mean. We pray for all your children around the world today. Especially on this special day when the sun and the moon bless us with their presence. We pray for those who are absent. We think about those who've been mentioned in our prayers. And we raise up prayers of gratitude for Gary Friend and Art Arve's ministries. And all that they mean for us in the life of this congregation. We're grateful for that call that they received and followed through. We pray also for those who are mourning the passing of Stephen Leslie and his presence is remembered here by many. And we are grateful for the gifts that he offered here in this place. We pray for Emily Blau and uh, all the uh, joys and the frights of parenthood and delivery of children. We're grateful that uh, there has been a good result. We pray that you be with both mother and child in their recovery from a difficult time. Spirit of God, show us the way and lead us in the ways of peace all the days of our lives. Help us not only to do the right thing, but also give us the courage to step out in faith, knowing that you guide our steps. Remind us that in our faith and in this world, there are semicolons and there are commas. And help us not to put you in a box. We want to be a life-saving church, a church that is not afraid to dig deep into our hearts and offer to you our best. 
like all those faithful Jewish friends of ours who pray the Shema daily. We silently name all of our family and friends who left us too soon. We mourn and lament those people who are no longer with us. And we look for your strength in a time of need as we try to understand and move forward. We remember that when your son came into this world, he had an eye for the person on the side of the road. He had an eye for the oppressed person, the one in jail, the one that was ill, the one that was outcast. We know what his eyes were like. Help us to have them. We remember that when your son was among us, he gave us a prayer to pray regularly when we're together. And he said, any time you pray together, you should always say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I want to invite you to please rise as we join together in our sending hymn, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs>
moving in love and compassion, pursuing justice and mercy, and trusting in the God of peace. For the source of all life and love is as close as your very breath. Breathe deeply. Amen. His Bible.